people, lazy and evil For years I've watched y'all allow Donald Trump turn you to crazy people Where's that freedom ego when you Welcome to Three Count Commentaries As we discuss the very first Cody Free AEW Dynamite It's not the first episode without Cody Rhodes But it's the first episode since they announced Cody Rhodes was leaving They even took him out of the in opening in <laughs> video package but they did mention him a bunch of times throughout the evening, which means that, you know, they're not going the WWE route where when you're gone, you just never existed in the first place. All right. Positive. Um, this is your host, Mongo Slade. So we're going to be talking about a show that I actually did not entirely hate. But as part of the usual, when it comes to Dynamite, I hit a wall and I started losing interest more and more and more as the show went on. Nothing made me angry. Nothing pissed me off. But it was just kind of like, all right, but this is just uninteresting, you know. Uh, and it's partly because the matches were so long, you know. But at least pretty much most of the matches that occurred on this show had a reason to occur. So that was engaging. It's just sometimes the matches went a little too long. And uh, it takes you out of it. You probably could have got a lot more done on this show if they'd have shrunk some of these matches. But this is the first Dynamite I really didn't hate. You know, first one I had, it really didn't hate in a while. All right, so CM Punk starts the uh, show. He's sitting in the ring. He doesn't do the big entrance or nothing. And he's talking about, you know, being better than you. It's the foundation of his career. You know, he used it. It was during the straight edge. And um, he's glad to be an inspiration. He's inspired people to be straight edge, inspired people to sit like him, talk like him, walk like him. MJF is one of those guys. And said that he's proud of MJF for beating him twice in Chicago, but didn't, but MJF didn't learn the lessons. He didn't retain those lessons. And since he won last week, he is now going to pick the time, place, and t match type. And then he says that it's two days after Valentine's Day, and act will MJF be his Valentine? I told you before, there's always some latent homosexuality in uh, Dynamite. I have no idea why that is. It's just always there. It's just always present. You know, like every week they're talking about butt pounding guys and all this stuff. But this at least had a double meaning. This is a double entendre when he says he wants MJF to be his Valentine. He said he wanted to pick a cage match, but MJF can still escape a cage and, you know, Wardlow can climb a cage. And he says he wants to pick a match that he's actually lost before a match that MJF cannot escape in. And so he picks a dog collar match because MJF always wants to be close to him. And since you want to be handcuffed to me so much, why don't you be my Valentine? Fight me in this dog collar match. So the be my Valentine means Greg Valentine who fought Roddy Piper. That's why he kept saying Piper in Portland. You know, I'm as good as Piper in Portland as the greatest Chicago, uh, PCM punk in Chicago. So, um, uh, if you don't know, um, I think it was star K 83, had the very the classic Piper and Greg Valentine dog collar match. It's probably one of the most dog, uh, famous dog collar matches ever. Uh, great match, absolutely. You know, for sure. I'm, I'm sure if you if even spent a moment on Twitter, all the nerds are posting pictures of it. So um, that's the match, the dog collar match. MJF didn't have anything to say about it. So this is fine. I like this, actually. Um, I don't like that they're kind of sublimating a cage match to the dog collar match but i get why they would do that i would think you know part of the rules of the match is mjf cannot win the match unless he's literally hooked you know chained to punk so and, but the match is no disqualification no count outs whatever so whatever but i like the match type it's, it's different um it's almost guaranteed to be violent so, uh, and it's, and this feud actually deserves a big finish, a big violent finish. So this match is going to at least deliver that. CM Punk has done, uh, dark collar matches in Ring of Honor. Um, most famously, I think he did one with Jimmy Raven. I believe he also did one with Raven. That's the one I was thinking of. Um, I know a lot of people was talking about the Jimmy Rave match. I had never seen that, so I don't know, but he did quite a few, um, special kinds of matches. Um, but he said he picked this one because he lost in it, but he learned something from it. So this was all good. Didn't mind the MJF CM Punk stuff. Then we move on to Brian Danielson and Lee Moriarty. 
they had a lengthy match. Lee Moriarty's record was five and two. And um it this was basically a showcase for Lee Moriarty. And uh I I, I they got the crowd got really hyped for that spot where their legs were tied together and they were standing on their necks, smacking each other or slapping each other's rib cage. I don't think they could even reach each other's faces. I've seen this of course in uh Lucha Libre uh promotions. I've also seen it in a lot of other work rate shows. To me, I don't see the purpose in it. It's not a submission hold. So it's like, you're not going to win by submission. What is the point of this? You know, it's just, you're upside down. It's just pointless acrobatics, but the crowd seemed to like it. Uh, Lee Moriarty was positioned as being, you know, going hold for hold with Danielson. Danielson kept smacking him, disrespecting him. One time he smacked him one time too many and Lee Moriarty kind of fired up. And this is when I lost interest in Lee Moriarty. When he did the, the facial, the, the night, it had a really good facial, facial expression, you know, the grim look. Like, you know, you smacked me too many times, but then he came with these weak punches and then those chicken wing forearms. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Somebody needs to tell this kid, just throw a punch, man. Just throw a punch or open hand snap of something. You have to reach too far with these chicken wings. Like, why are you not using your hands? Like, you have fucking hands. Use your hands. <laughs> you know, like... Use your goddamn hands. That's why they're on the end of your wrist. You know, I don't, I don't understand why. Why throw forearms when you have hands? You have you can chop, you can slap, you can punch all with your hands. Use your hands. You don't need to use your forearms. You know, it's it's very strange to me that you know Danielson kind of likes the MMA style. He also throws forearms, which is you know weird to me. Like you don't you you only see forearms in UFC when it's a downed opponent or something like that, and somebody's trying to pull guard. So you use forearms to kind of separate you. Otherwise, they're trying to throw punches. Throw a punch for Christ's sake! Throw a fucking punch. That was the only thing that kind of pissed me off, though. Uh, the big finish came with Danielson stomping Lee Moriarty's head in. Then he put him in a triangle choke. Well, Lee Moriarty was out. Uh, Danielson wins. Uh, Lee Moriarty didn't even submit. It was referee stoppage. Uh, not bad from Lee Moriarty. Can't wait to see him come back in two months. Um, cause they're not going to build on this at all. And, uh, it kind of says a lot that you kind of go through the work, go through the effort of making this guy almost, I don't know, an equal of Brian Danielson physically going hold for hold, counter hold with Danielson. And he's probably never going to win another fucking match, you know? He's not on TV. He's going to go back to wrestling job guys and losing in, you know, to other guys. That's the, that's storyline stuff that they really need to consider. I get why they did this because they were in storyline trying to get uh, Danielson to teach Moriarty a thing or two about violence, which they did. You know, they did a good job of that. But, you know, how is, does this change Lee Moriarty? You know, if he doesn't show back up for another month or two, how can, you know, you have to follow up. So he should have a match next week where he decimates his opponent because he had this match where he, he had, he was close with Danielson. So you should be able to beat most everybody else, right? Let's see how that actually turns out. All right. So Danielson, uh, cuts a promo. Um, this was actually pretty good. He asked the crowd if Lee Moriarty passed or failed his lesson about violence. The crowd, of course, says that Moriarty passed. And Danielson said he doesn't trust the American public. <laughs> so so uh, he wants an answer from Moxley. Uh, Moxley comes out there, says that a decade ago, he was a lot like a lot of the hungry young kids in AEW. You know, poor, frustrated, angry, mean, out to chomp something. Then he talked about, you know, meeting Brian Danielson for the first time. The great Brian Danielson. He went all balls out and lost. But it made him want it more. It made him angrier. And each time they wrestled, he kept coming up short. And he has actually never beaten Brian Danielson. So he was excited when Danielson showed up. And he was interested to put that head on his wall to slay the dragon he has yet to slay. Then, you know, he says that Danielson doesn't want to fight him. Danielson wants to create with him. And he said that he thought about it. He considered it. He couldn't find a reason to say no when he considered the epic uh, unmitigated violent empire they could create and the opportunity for them to, to be able to um, build something and to give back to AEW, to give back to this business. But he says that he beginning to question 
whether Danielson wants to stand side by side rather than standing across from him because he fears him. Then he says that uh, he's not saying yes, not saying no, but he won't stand side by side any uh, with any man until they bleed together first. Um, of course, we know Moxie, that's not true. You know, <laughs> considering Moxie was on teams with Punk just last week. Uh, anyway, uh, this was a little long. I felt like this promo was a little long. Uh, too much history, too much of a history lesson. Where you know that's the thing about AEW. You know they talking about the the indies, the independents, and all this kind of stuff. And that led a lot of the nerds to do the Googles and looking up when this show was. And I think it was in 2010. It's like something that was 12 years ago. How can that possibly be relevant to today? You know, all he instead of going through all that, he could have just said, you know, you're the one guy I never got a chance to beat. You know, whether whether here or there, every time we wrestled, you won, you you've won, but I've never beaten you. You know, and then going to his same thing, but he had to tell this long story about being an upset youth and going into this independent promotion to face the great Brian Danielson, who was the best wrestler in the world or whatever. And uh, I was like, okay, sure, you know, I, I buy it, but. Um, Moxley is essentially saying they have to fight, but uh, I'm okay with this. Um, I don't think they'll get to the part of teaming up together. I don't think they're going to make it that far. <laughs> but um, it's all right. At least Moxley has a reason to want to fight him. Uh, Danielson ha- doesn't have a reason to fight him. But this is this is cool, I guess. Now you know Danielson kind of has a reason. If he wants to be his partner, he has to fight him. Um, all right. Um, that's not heat, but okay. I guess it's something It's better than nothing. And I think mostly people are just interested in this match and just want this match to happen. I'm interested in the Alliance more than the match, to be quite honest, because I'm interested in how these two guys would operate as a team, you know, with Danielson being a little bit more, he, they're both sadistic, but in their own way. You know, Moxley is more of a deathmatch psycho, you know, um, while Danielson is a little bit more of a sociopath in terms of, you know, physically abusing his opponents and mocking them and everything. Um, so it's it's hard. Like a, a match is a match, but I'm interested in the story, you know, and I feel like once the match happens, the story is essentially going to be over and because it's going to turn into a regular wrestling feud after that. But, um, so this is, this is, this is all fine. I didn't have a problem with this. Uh, Jurassic Express, they had a promo where they broke down that the tag division needed to change, but the one thing that would be, remain the same is that they would be the tag team champions. Then they said there's going to be a tag team battle royal. And then in two weeks, there's going to be a tag team casino battle royal. And I was like, what the fuck? What the fuck? What is that? That sounds silly. Like, it's automatically a triple threat match at uh, the pay-per-view. So, my my view is pick the top two tag teams. Done, right? Like, you have rankings for a reason. Pick the top two tag teams. Whoever the top two tag teams are, those are your opponents. Why go through this Battle Royal stuff? Why go through the Casino Battle Royal stuff? I don't know. Whatever. And, of course, we got another weird comment with Jungle Boy talking about how much he loved three ways. One big old oof after another. Uh, Very strange, man. Very, very strange stuff. Keith Lee cut a promo. And Keith Lee used all of his good college education. He used all the five-letter words he got in his mind. The anticipation was palpable. (laughs) Said that he's a new face of the revolution. And that he's coming to make a statement. And this is the one time where you don't save the best for last. He's still doing the Neil deGrasse Tyson voice. Where um, he just sounds like he's about to start talking about Neptune and Saturn's rings and how many stars are in the Milky Way and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's college professor voice, you know, intelligent monster. It's okay. You know, it's not terrible, but it's it doesn't exactly flow or feel very natural to me either. You know, it just feels like a voice he put on. 
Like, um, the guy looks like Uncle Phil and he sounds like Jeffrey. You know, like, that's really weird. Without the accent. But, um, it, it is what it is, man. Um, I'm not against this, though. We'll give, give, him some, give him some time. Give him some time. <clears throat> uh, Wardlow defeated Max Caster in the Face of the Revolution qualifier. So now they even put Wardlow and Keith Lee in the same match. And I have to talk about that match in a second. Uh, the rap of Max Caster called in uh, Wardlow MJF's bitch boy. Took some shots at Nashville Hot Chicken and the Tennessee Titans. Of course, he got powerbombed out of his boots. Um, Bowens attacked Wardlow after the match. He also got powerbombed. Spears did not help him. So that was one of the things that you know they told us to pay attention to that Spears did not help. So um, Wardlow essentially destroyed the acclaimed. Uh, so now let's talk about this face of the revolution ladder match. All right. So we were told you and me that the TNT championship is open challenge. Therefore you can be Jay lethal and come straight off the street, zero and zero making your debut in the company and get a title match for that championship. You can be Warhorse, be a guy who's not even signed to a contract not only come from your from your day job of cleaning toilets to come over here and wrestle for the TNT title. All right, that's a nice, that's an okay standard to set. It's open challenge. All right, cool. So why the ladder match? What is the ladder match for? To put you as the number one contender? Uh, Why do you need to be number one contender? Why not just answer the open challenge? I mean, nobody, nobody can, it's like, like Darby Allen didn't have to win a ladder match to get a title shot. And you can say, well, hey, it's a, it's different. In in wrestling, you can find different routes to the the title. You know, hey, not everybody's going to win the Royal Rumble, or not everybody's going to, you know, win the Money in the Bank. I'm like, okay, I get that. But usually, there's a reason why a guy is challenging for the title. You know, they don't really set the 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 standard of it's open challenge. Anybody can just show up. Indie guys can just show up and wrestle for the belt. That's not a standard everybody sets, you know? So when you set that standard that is essentially you versus the world, what is the point of going through uh, something as dangerous as a ladder match to become number one contender for a title that somebody can just walk off the street and challenge for? This face of the revolution thing should be the number one contender for the world title. Because that's the one title that you need to be a top contender to get. That makes more sense to me, doesn't it? Why is it? I never understood why it's for the TNT belt and the TNT belt is open challenge. That's silly. It's silly. Just change it. Just change it from TNT to world title. That's all. And then it doesn't guarantee that the world title match is going to be next week, next month, whatever. It could be in two months. It could be like a briefcase a guy walks around with and says, hey, whenever I'm ready. I'm going to be the world champion. I got, you've got to wrestle me for the world title. Lucha Underground had a version of it, the Gift of the Gods title, right? You had to give the champion a week in advance or something like that. That's what you, you could do that. Steal that concept. You know, the face of the revolution. And you wrestle for the world title, but you have to give the champion a week in advance. You know, or a month in advance or something like that. So that would have been fine. But having people destroy their bodies for the same opportunity that somebody can just walk off the street and get. It seems weird to me, but I ain't Booker of the Year, so I don't know what I'm talking about. All right, uh, Mercedes Martinez. No, she says no disqualifications, no excuses. Britt Baker wants Thunder Rosa finished. Finito. Done. Done for. And says that she wants to become the most powerful woman in the wrestling business. (laughs) And she's got the best sensei. And some guy showed up. And I'm like, who's that guy? And I still don't know who that guy is. Um, so I, this is one of those times where I don't know who the celebrity is. I just have no idea who the celebrity is. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's just how it is. I don't know who this guy is. So this was all went over my head. In any event, um, after Mercedes leaves, um, she talks to... Sensei unknown to which he says that if she fails, destroy her. And then, you know, Britt Baker was like, 
Uh, okay, okie dokie. So the match later on, Mercedes Martinez versus Thunder Rosa, no disqualification. Uh, Thunder Rosa is wearing Kill Bill gear because everything's about cosplay around here. Uh, there was a couple of really ugly bumps in this match. I mean, oh boy, Jesus H. Christ. Thunder Rosa fell on the back of her head once. It was such an ugly bump. And the top rope elbow drop from Mercedes Martinez was not smooth. It was actually quite ugly. It was it was a rough one. It was a rough one between these two girls. Not as violent as I thought it would be. I was expecting I was, you know, not expecting them to gig because it wasn't the main event. But I was expecting a little bit, you know, harder of a hardcore match. Um so after the match, Britt Baker goes over to Unknown Sensei once more one more time. He tells her again to destroy Mercedes Martinez. So, uh, Rebel and Jamie Hayter jumped Thunder Rosa and was beating her up. Uh, Britt Baker grabs a pipe. She's going to hit Thunder Rosa with the pipe. Then, boom, she hits Mercedes Martinez. Mercedes Martinez is down. They jump her and beat her up, too. And, um, so Mercedes Martinez got turned babyface in this whole situation. After being the, the mercenary of, uh, Britt Baker, she's now on... I guess her and Thunder Rosa have on the same side. I guess. Um, poor Mercedes Martinez. <laughs> I mean, I guess. I guess now. But, like, you can't really put her as a contender for the title, can you? How can you believably make her a contender for the title when she just lost to Thunder Rosa? Like, you can't, you can't do that. So, what do you do? Like, what do you do for Mercedes Martinez? I guess you have her beat up Rebel and uh, Jamie Hayter. I guess. I guess that's the next option. Um, but what about Thunder Rosa and Britt Baker? Like, I'm guessing they're about to have another fucking match because they seem the only thing they can do is have them two feud with each other. Like, Thunder Rosa is the only credible woman for Britt Baker to actually wrestle around here other than Jay Cargill, but they're never going to be in the same ring together. I don't know, man. Uh, this is a mess, though. Uh, you know, <laughs> I just want to know, nerds, please, who's the sensei? I feel I feel so out of the loop not knowing who the sensei is. All right. Now we get to the part of the show where I actually lost interest. Um I was kind of I was like, okay, buddy. Hangman Page and Adam Cole, baby. Bye. Oh, so before Hangman even got to breathe into the microphone, Adam Cole came out there. Said that Hangman had been in some wars and that he deserves to be world champion, saying that his title run is coming to an end. Um, Hangman said that he always wondered how Adam Cole felt watching his friends build an empire without him and said, this is the one world title you will never win. He also mentioned that they were ring of honor roommates. And I was like, oh, okay. So, uh, then they started talking about who's a bad friend. Uh, Adam Cole, uh, is not, is not a good friend, but Hangman doesn't hang out with the dark order anymore. He doesn't talk to the young bucks anymore. And Cole was very sad and said, look, I made some mistakes. But uh, when you getting in the ring with me, that was a mistake, man. Uh, then Cole says that, you know, after they have that match, he's going to go back to being the other Adam. Like he always is when they're in the same company. And, uh, Hangman Page puts the belt down and uh, he's ready to fight, you know, because apparently he just he's just ready to fight. OK, um. Cole then backs down, cowardly heel, says that he loves and admires them. They've known each other for a decade. Wants to shake his hand. Hangman doesn't want to shake hands. He said, okay, our match is going to be one-on-one, mano y mano, you versus me, no shenanigans. He leaves the ring. But they got some nice little shadow uh, shot of uh, Adam Cole smirking as he walked away. Because Red Dragon attacked Kylo, not Kylo Riley and Bobby Fish. They attacked Hangman from behind. Stomped him out, beat him up. Uh, <laughs> Adam Cole came back there to do the same. They all stomped on him and tap danced all over him. AEW officials ran down to the ring to break this all up. Then here comes the Dark Order. The Dark Order comes down there to help out. They fight off. They run off, rather. The Undisputed Era. I'm sorry. To, I forgot what I called him. What was my nickname for him? The uh, Irrefutable Era, I think it was called him. Um, so... They got they got run off by the Dark Order. 
And then for some reason, the the one guy that's in the dark water that wears a mask got real turned up and started beating up the security guys. And I was like, who is this guy? And why is he doing this? Um, apparently he's going to be wrestling Adam Cole on Rampage. So there that go. I guess that explains it, right? I guess that explains it. Um, all right, whatever. Um, so Darby, uh, well, no, nah, not whatever, not whatever, not whatever, not, not, not. This sucks. Uh, it didn't make me angry, but this didn't, I didn't buy this as, as the main event feud of the pay-per-view. I didn't buy it. It felt like they were trying to put this feud in the microwave. You know, Danielson and, and, and Moxley feels like they're building to something strong. Something solid. Punk and MJF is going to probably be the big blow-off of a months-long feud. That feels more like the main event. This feels like, you know, not quite marquee. Like, you're on the card, but you're not the top guy on the card. Your face shouldn't be on the poster. You know? Your your name is in small print under CM Punk versus. MJF dog collar match. John Moxley versus Brian Danielson. Plus, the AEW world title will be defended. Hangman Page versus Adam Cole. You know? And then it was like they were basically the same guy. You know, uh there was somebody, some genius in the crowd that had a Adam Cole has a dad bot sign. <laughs> uh <laughs> That was great. That was excellent. But this doesn't feel like a main event feud to me. Um, mainly because Adam Cole lost the last big match he was in. Now he's just going to be feeding off of J. Browns like you know, Evil Uno and Dark Order guys. It's like, I guess they serve a purpose, but that's not interesting. They just did this with Brian Danielson. Where it's, we got to beat up all the Dark Order guys before we have the match with Hangman. You know, so he's eventually going to have to, he's already wrestled with, with, with that, who was the guy, the other major dwarf. Um, you know, the one that kept calling him Budge. I can't remember what his name is. Who cares? He's already beat up Evil Uno. But um, this was, this was, this was, this, 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 they're not selling me on this. This sucks. All right, this sucks. Now I can finally move on to Darby. So Darby and uh, Sammy Guevara, they have a short vignette hyping up the main event where Darby says that, you know, me and Sammy Guevara, people have said that we have a death wish. If you go back and watch how we work, um, I think you can see that, you know, there's something missing within me, a void. The last time that void was filled, I was the TNT champion. I think it's the only thing that can fill that void. And Sammy Guevara is just there. He's present. He's got a, he's got weird hair. You know, but he's there and says that, oh, yeah, you know, we've wrestled each other before. He's beaten me. I've beaten him. You know, but none of that matters now. Or, But I think also in this match, they mentioned that Darby had never lost to Sammy Guevara. I don't know how that goes. And I'm not going to even hold you up. I don't I really don't care either. Uh, but so let's talk about that match. Not while they were here. Sammy Guevara versus Darby Allen for the TNT Championship. And this match was an absolute car crash. The two guys, you know, they shook hands before the match and then proceeded to crash into each other all night. And then if they didn't crash into each other, they were taking some of the ugliest bumps to ever be performed in a match. Then they threw in maybe one or two cool spots in order to to spice things up. But that uh, bump that... Uh, Darby Allen took when he bounced off the turn buckle and flipped over. It's like these dudes just won't help. They won't stop until they kill one another um, or kill each other or kill themselves. Sammy Guevara jumped on the ring apron and looked like he broke his arm and ribs. He was obviously okay, but these guys, man, they have, there is absolutely no thought into the future. It's just reckless abandon all the time. And it's like, uh, it's bad business. I guess it's good for the moment because you get the oohs and the eyes from the crowd and people appreciate it. 
But, bro, you're going to feel that. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> that's going to catch up with you eventually. Um, There was a sweet dive. You know, one of Darby was trying to do one of his dives. He had a Tope Suicida that ends up getting countered into a, like an RKO. Would have been a nice little spot to uh, to kind of end on. But, of course, they did 100 things after that, so it didn't matter. The finish came when Darby finally ha- seemed to have Sammy Guevara beat. Then Jose jumped on the ring apron. Jose, who works for Andrade El Idolo. Um, the referee is trying to get Jose down. Uh, Sting takes out Jose. Andrade El Idolo. He slaps the iPad across the head of Darby Allen. Darby Allen is laid out while he's um, on the top rope because he was about to ready, get ready to do the, the uh, coffin drop. Uh, Sammy Guevara gets up and just the GTH. One, two, three. Sammy Guevara wins. After the match, Matt Hardy and Andrade El Idolo, they jumped uh, Darby and... Uh, and uh, <laughs> Sammy Guevara. Then they commandeered both of the TNT championships. And Andrade held the belts up like, Look at me! Look at me! I am Andrade El Idolo! And um, as his very gangster Desperado theme played in the background. Uh, the finish. Not good. Not good. Not good. Look. We're not going to give a clean finish to a babyface versus babyface match. Okay. Right. But I think that this, this, the, the spot to the end was kind of whack. It was, it just felt weak. It was felt like a weak finish. You got, uh, Darby clearly trying to climb to the top to do the coffin drop and he's waiting for, for Jose to come in and break it up. So he's kind of hanging out there like, uh, like Jose, Jose, come on. And Jose kind of f- finally hops up there. And then Darby Allen was, you know, for a long time, he was, again, a bulletproof midget. You know, you could shoot him out of a cannon. You can, you know, drop anvils on him. You can do whatever you wanted, and he would get back up. And now all of a sudden, he gets whopped across the head with like an iPad, like a $200 device. And all of a sudden, he's slumped like a dead man. And I was like, at least he was selling it, I guess. <laughs> um... I just, I just didn't like, I, like, I'm, I'm not a fan of Sammy Guevara. You know, it's just, I, I has nothing, I just can't get over it. Like, I don't like this guy. You know, I just don't like him. Uh, but the match wasn't awful. I just didn't like the finish. Um, also, the, the, the decision to have Andrade cost Darby Allen the match makes sense because Andrade did say he was the next TNT champion. But you have to ask the question, you know, why does Andrade care who he wins the title from? You know, again, the title is open challenge, man. Who who cares who you wins it from, who you win it from? But I get the big picture. The big picture is that he wants Darby to come work for him. Darby rebuffed him, therefore he blasted Darby in the head with the iPad. Doesn't want Darby to succeed. Okay, I get it. Um so my question now is, is this a tag team match, a six man tag? Like it's going to be Matt Hardy, Andrade El Idolo, and somebody else versus Sting, Darby, and Sammy Guevara? Cause that seems like that's where we're going with this. At least a tag team match with Matt and Andrade versus Sammy and Darby. That seems like the least of the matches that could come out of this. And I'm not, I'm not sure I'm thrilled about that. Not sure I like it. I'm just not interested in seeing Matt Hardy. And I know that uh, um, Matt and Jeff, they're about to do some tag team stuff on the independents. That uh, they're actually reforming the Hardy Boys to wrestle Enzo and Cass. They're also going to be wrestling some other tag team. I'm trying to remember who they were. It's another pretty famous, well, lower famous tag team that wrestling um, on the independents. But... I just have no interest in seeing Matt Hardy. Just none. Like, I've seen, I've been watching the Hardy Boys since 1995 or 1996. I just don't have any interest in Matt. You know, just none. My, I have, still have significant interest in Jeff. I just have, don't have any in Matt. Just none. And I've seen the Hardy Boys reform before in other promotions. And, 
I just don't have any interest in it. I just don't, man. Like it's it's always good to see the Hardy Boys together, you know, but Matt is just so limited physically and he's getting worse every year. He's getting worse every month. I just don't care. You know, so if you bring Matt in, so what? Well, you bring Jeff in, so what? You know, he's just going to be hanging out with Matt. And um, all the news clips, and let's talk about this while I'm here. All the news clips I've seen about the Hardy Boys, it's just Matt telling us what Jeff said or what Jeff thinks. Like, does Jeff ever fucking talk anymore? Does he not talk for himself now? It's all of a sudden, it's Matt thinks that Jeff was doing this and Jeff was doing that. Now, I was right. That uh, Matt claims that Jeff turned down the Hall of Fame because it was only going to be a Jeff Hardy Hall of Fame, not a Hardy Boys Hall of Fame, which I kind of figured was the was the thing. Um, he also said that he uh, passed his drug test. But my thing is, they said he passed his drug test for not having illegal drugs or non prescription drugs. They did not say that he didn't have any drugs that's a that's a different thing if he tested positive for something that was prescribed you can still have a problem with scripts all right so but as far as i know jeff was uh clean he's going to go to aew and i'm like okay that's good for aew i've watched jeff everywhere he goes i'm a big fan of jeff just not a big fan of matt and um Jeff's going to have to carry that albatross once again. It seems like he really, really likes having Matt around because Matt can handle some of the business stuff. He doesn't have to handle it. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, that's fun. You know, he can go back to just being chill, Matt, Jeff Hardy, and not have to be the businessman. He can let Matt do it. But I have zero interest in watching Matt Hardy wrestle. Just none. And um, I think the longer he hangs around, the less interest other people have in him too. I think that if the moment we found that they're going to be reforming the Hardy boys in AEW and it's pretty much set in stone, they should just snatch Matt off TV, right? Matt off TV. You know, that's what have been the first thing you would have did. Like you should have had on oh, day after he sold the Hardy family office time, Dry day, I thought he just killed him, knock him off TV. Cause then you at least, you know, on is, you know, bringing private party up, yada, yada, yada. And then when the Hardy boys come in, they have ready-made opponents, you know, but I don't know. I don't know what they're doing and I don't give a shit. Matt Hardy fucking sucks. And I'm not interested in Matt Hardy. He's ugh, ooh boy. All right. So, uh, let's go back. So we got the, the elite. We're alive, pal. All right. So, um, the, the young bucks, they were asked, where were you guys when we were beating up the hangman? And the Young Buck says that beating up on Hangman Page is like beating a dead horse. You know, they'll beat up on anybody but him. Red Dragon was like, okay, well, we'll accept that for odd reasons. And then they started arguing about who's got kids. And that's why, you know, they weren't around because Kyle O'Reilly just had a baby. And Nick and Matt Jackson both said, oh, we've got babies. And um, Adam Cole was like, I don't got no baby because my girlfriend is apparently more famous than I am. In any event, uh, they have made up their minds that they're going to be in the tag team championship thing. And it was, oh, there's two spots. And maybe Red Dragon gets one of them. Maybe the Young Bucks get the other. Hey, what about that? And they realize they're going to be competitors in this endeavor, this tag team endeavor. The Young Bucks go one way. Uh, Red Dragon goes the other way. And. Adam Cole stuck in the middle. Stuck in the middle with you. Uh, Brandon Cutler. And Brandon Cutler is being very on the nose. Which way will you go, Adam? And it's like, man, just kick this fool. You know, hit him in the nuts or something. Uh, the, anything that involves the Young Bucks is not good. Um, they're trying to tell this story. What? Uh, it, it feel like they were just doing this with Kenny Omega. That's, it's, it kind of feels like they were just doing this. Where it's all about where you, where does your loyalties lie? Like who are your real friends? Just bullet club stuff, man. It's it's especially whack on an AEW. It's it's whew, it's bad in impact. It's not good. But in AEW, oh, it's so obnoxious. It's probably because it feels like something out of a soap opera. 
you know, but it's not, doesn't have the interesting over the top elements of a soap opera. Like, you know, NXT 2.0 has a lot of soap opera elements, but it's very over the top. You know, like soap operas tend to be really over the top. You know, that's, that was when wrestling was good. When you had over the top shit, like Lita being pregnant, like that's absurd. Lita is not pregnant, but it's, it's, it's interesting. You're like, okay, wait a minute. She, she's pregnant. All right. How are they going to get themselves out of Oh, they killed the baby. Oh God. Oh, Snitsky's going to punt the baby. Oh shit. You know, <laughs> you know, you're going to, you never forget shit like that. You know, you don't forget shit like that. But this is like, I don't care who's Adam Cole's real friends. To me, this, this is, this feels PG. This feels like playground shit. You know, I don't know. That's just me. All right. Uh, Jake Hager and Chris Jericho were defeated by Santana and Ortiz. Uh, Eddie Kingston made a surprise return to a huge reaction. And he was in the corner of Santana and Ortiz. This was quite good. Got to give kudos to Jake Hager and Chris Jericho for being in great shape. Both of them got rid of their guts. You know, Jericho looks noticeably so much better. He moves so much better. You know, he's and Hager is in better shape. Excellent. I see a lot of people saying Jericho's getting back in shape because he's going back to Vince. I don't think so. I think uh, Jericho has said that he wants to finish his career in AEW. Um, I'm pretty sure that Tony Khan would probably let him. Though Jericho, now that the inner circle, I'm guessing, is gone. I'm guessing there's no more inner circle now. Um, Tony Khan probably doesn't need Jericho anymore. You know, like, to do what? He's not going to be world champion again. You know, um, he took the pin in this match, too, so they using him to put guys over. Um, I, I don't know what Jericho could be doing now. You know, he's going to feud with Eddie Kingston, apparently, because him and Eddie Kingston got into a fight after the match. Um, and I like this. I like the finishing sequence, though, because the finishing sequence was pretty good. Jericho gets Santana in the lion tamer, the walls of Jericho. And Santana is, you know, of course, he's struggling. He's being tortured. And you got Eddie Kingston outside the ring, and he's really motivating Santana. He's pounding the ring apron and yelling at him to grab the rope. And he's really talking him up. And it's through Eddie Kingston's motivation that Santana grabs the rope. This led Jericho to kick Eddie Kingston and really generate some booze from the audience. But uh, being distracted by Eddie Kingston is how he ends up getting pinned. And then after the match, Jericho goes after Eddie Kingston and you have to be separated. So Kingston and, and Chris Jericho could be very interesting. I look forward to that. I like that. You know, I that's that's good stuff. And I'm glad Jericho's gotten in shape to, to get it done. Hopefully Eddie Kingston has gotten into some shape too. It doesn't seem, it didn't seem like it, but I know that he said that he wanted to, he wanted to get in better shape because he wants to be world champion. Um, I'm glad to see these guys, you know, get some work ethic. You know, that's fucking awesome. Eddie Kingston, he's looked the same every time I've seen him for the last five or six years. And I'm not, you know, familiar that I've been watching Eddie Kingston for years. Like, no, I've been watching him on and off on Evolve or, something else for years. And he's always had the same Homer Simpson, like body type, you know? So if he's finally, you know, now that he's making some money and he sees the opportunity to get a real push and he's going to go in there and really bust his ass, maybe, you know, stop eating cake and smoking cigarettes or whatever. That's great. You know, I'm not going to knock a guy for getting in better shape, you know, as an independent contractor, that's his, you know, that's his bread and butter. You know, the longer he can do it, the better shape he's in, the more he can do, you know, I'm not saying he's going to come out Lex Luger. He doesn't need to be Lex Luger. He just needs to be, you know, better stamina and, you know, just a better look for himself. You know, that would be great. So, and I actually love the idea of Jericho and, and Eddie Kingston. You know, the promos could be pretty fire. You know, that could be fun. My question is just, what does Jericho do? What does Hager do? For Christ's sake, if there's no more inner circle, why even keep Hager? Why, why keep him around? You know, if you're going to let Cody go, why the fuck are we keeping Jake Hager? He's more, far more useless than Cody. You know, if you talk about a useless scale, Hager is, uh, he's, he's on the brandy side of the scale. You know, 
He's a very useless motherfucker. Very useless. I don't know. All right, so what what more is there to discuss? Um, let's look at this paper here. Uh, Malachi Black. So there's going to be a new member of Malik of uh, House of Black. Um, they talk about how violence creates things, but not without judgment. Um, so they're going to have some new members. Uh, okay, I don't really have. It's just him and Brody King that haven't done that much, you know. So I don't see what it, you know, how far it's going to go. But they're going to have a rematch with Pac and Penta. I'm thinking that's probably where they're going to introduce the new Penta, uh, Penta uh, Obscuro or whatever. All right, sure. Um, who could join the House of Black? A lot of people wanted to be Julia Hart. Uh, I'll be interested in seeing it. Uh, Cause I, you know, it's hard to say whether she can pull it off or not until you actually see it, you know? So, um, Jay white cut a promo too. And he says that, you know, um, he defeated Kenny Omega for the new Japan United States title. And if he hadn't done that, maybe Kenny Omega would have stayed in new Japan. So if he just stayed in new Japan, it wouldn't be an AEW. Therefore AEW, you're welcome. Then he talks about, uh, himself and you know how he's going to dominate AEW and you're all going to learn to breathe with the switchblade. Um, he's definitely, a, uh, an afterthought, you know, because he wasn't supposed to be there. So he's absolute afterthought. He's going to be beating up on some guy on rampage that nobody cares about. So poor, poor Jay white. He was brought in because Tony Khan felt like he had to bring somebody in. And that's the only reason he's there. And therefore, Jay White just floats with no real storyline. He's not even really involved with the other elite members or anything else. So, it's just sad. So, I lost interest in this show around the Hangman Adam Cole thing. But it was nothing terrible on the show. Nothing that made me want to, you know, scream and holler. You know, the stuff that was terrible... I just wrote it off as being bad. You know, like Hangman and Cole. I didn't like that. Thunder Rosa and Mercedes Martinez was a little bit disappointing. Um, it was very botchy. Um, so, but, you know, it was a, if I, it wasn't a terrible show, but nothing on it was, you know, outside of the Danielson stuff and the punk stuff, nothing else on it was like stupendous that I absolutely needed to see, you know. It's just typical AEW. The matches were too long. Job guys standing around forever. And um, that's just kind of how they, they book their shows, man. There's nothing you can do about that. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.